Okay, since we've got standing standing room only, since we've got standing room only, let's let's get started. I'm Barbara Mead. I'm one of the founders of Politics and Prose, and this is just delightful for me to introduce John Muller again uh, today. Uh, John was here uh, about a year and a half ago to talk about his uh, first biography of, uh, uh, I'm sorry, Frederick Douglass. And it was such a just perfect occasion that right away the audience suggested we should have a tour to Frederick Douglass's house, and uh, which happened. And John says that now that he's going to uh, start some tours to Mark Twain's houses, house in, in Washington, so that uh, that that's going to be uh, an added uh, bonus to this book. I also told John that he's uh, very timely. The uh, Washington Post uh, list of what's in and what's out for 2014 had what's out is Dickinsonian-sized volumes and what's What's in is slim volume, so we have a nice slim volume that's right, 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 right on time uh, for t for 2014. Um, I was not, it was, uh, John's uh, book was, uh, Frederick Douglass was so good that I was not surprised to learn that History Pe Press, his publisher, immediately contracted with him to write another book, uh, this time a chronicle of um, Mark Twain's brief but unchronicled uh, time in Washington, D.C. John's day job is an associate librarian in the Washingtoniana division of the Martin Luther King Library. Uh, but I want you all to know that even though the D.C. Reads 2013 chose Frederick Douglass as its book for D.C. Reads. It was not an inside job because John was working at the D.C. Library. And this was online public voting that, uh, that, it, was that it was chosen for. Um, aside from uh, being an author and a historian, John's a local uh, reporter and journalist contributing to lots of Washington media. He graduated from George Washington University, and he's also a member of the Washington Historical, uh, the, the Historical Society of Washington. And uh, on top of all that, he co-founded a theater company, Dream C City Theater Group, which was a finalist for three Mayor's Arts Awards, including Outstanding Contribution to Arts Education. Uh, several years ago, at an annual Washington, D.C. Historical Studies Conference, John presented a panel on the history of newspapers and journalism in Washington. And in researching for uh, the, uh, that, he, discovered, he learned about that Mark Twain had been a journalist in Washington for a brief period. And so that was the seed that planted this book, and John's going to tell us all about it. And uh, we won't sign you up for the tours today, but the list will be out there soon. Yeah, thanks, John. Thank you. All right. Thank you, everyone, for, thank you everyone for being here. Uh, let me get my time here. Uh, I want to just give quick, sh uh, quick acknowledgments and shout outs to Eleanor Dorr, my good friend who really was the, uh, gave me a book many years ago, which I lost, which I learned that Mark Twain actually been a, had been a journalist before he was a reporter, I mean before an author. This is when I only knew Mark Twain as Huckleberry Finn and uh, Gilded Age and Tom Sawyer and Huck, you know, I never knew that he was a journalist, but Eleanor Dorr many years ago at the D.C. Library gave me a antiquarian book, which D.C. Library still has books on their shelves from like the 1920s. But uh, okay, so Eleanor Dorr is here. I uh, wanted to give her a shout out. I used to actually live in the neighborhood. I used to live on Huntington Street. I used to work at Starbucks in the Avalon Theater. I used to actually come down here when I was broke. I didn't really have money to buy the books, so I'd just kind of come in here and read them and then leave. <laughs> but uh, but it was like really big. I got a, a, like a lot of tips or something from Starbucks. I might buy a magazine or a book. But anyway, so this is a very important place to me. It means a lot um, to be here for the second time. I thank everyone, uh, especially that we have uh, standing room only. So okay, also Greenwood Gators, there's some some of those folks in the house, Miss Maxine, my uh, colleague at the DC Library, I'll keep it brief, Uncle Gary, who I feature in the book, uh, my mother and father, my grandma, Hemmer, okay, I'll, no more acknowledgments, so I'll get right into the book. All right, so, um, so yeah, so everyone kind of knows Mark Twain is this omnipresent man in a white suit, Hal Holbrook has kind of popularized that, uh, 
that portrayal of Twain, but he was actually a journalist here in Washington. He was in the city from late November 1867 to March of 1868. This is actually after Mark Twain had premiered kind of his um, his literary pseudonym that was um, came into existence in early 1863 when he was a journalist in Nevada. I'm not sure how much how, how much people know here about Mark Twain. Um, let's give a brief, I guess, background. He's born in 18 1835 um, in Missouri. Uh, he's Mississippi riverboat pilot, uh, Civil War starts, his brother Orion is appointed the secretary to the Nevada Territory. His brother did not have the money to take the Wells Fargo stagecoach out there, which in this book I actually learned what shotgun means. I never knew what that meant before because shotgun on the Wells Fargo. So, uh, so anyway, so it goes out to Nevada, Twain kind of like um, spent some time around the mines and some other things. He's really kind of like a kind of like a wanderer, got involved with journalism. That's kind of how that was the start of or the genesis of the Mark Twain that we that we know. So when he's in Nevada, Nevada's in the process of becoming a state. So he kind of becomes buddies with Governor, uh, excuse me, James Nye, um, Senator William Stewart. Does anyone here know Stewart's Castle off of DuPont Circle? Sure. Okay. So that's that's the William Stewart that Twain was buddies with. Then when when um, when Nevada becomes a state, uh, these these folks who were involved with the territorial government they come to Washington. So now these guys, Twain knew these guys because he was a reporter uh, in in Nevada and would kind of write write these guys up in very favorable press. So Senator Stewart invites him to come to Washington to serve as his secretary. So that's kind of where this whole story starts. And um, I'll just read some of because before. I had some prepared remarks with Douglas. I kind of learned because uh, the Douglas talk was my first talk, so it was a little rough around the edges. I've done this Twain talk a couple times, so hopefully this is a little more polished. So I'll just read some of these quotes. Okay. To my thinking, Shakespeare had no more idea that he was writing for post posterity than Mark Twain has at the present time, and it sometimes amuses me to think how future Mark Twain scholars will puzzle over that gentleman's present hieroglyphics and occasion occasionally eccentric expressions. It was written by his buddy Charles Henry Webb in November 1865. Henry Webb is a, Charles Henry Webb is an interesting guy. He's one of the many kind of bohemian journalists that Twain hung around with in Washington. Now, Twain kept these notebooks, um, and there's been so much stuff that's been published about Mark Twain. And this is a quote that he writes when he first arrives in Washington in one of his personal notebooks. Fame is a vapor, popularity an accident. The only earthly certainty is oblivion. And then another one is, uh, this is from, this is from Ben Pearly Poor, who's a pretty famous journalist in his own right, and he talks about kind of the heritage of Washington news gatherers. Washington news gatherers may claim precedence in the ranks of that great American guild known as the press, for it is well established that metropolitan correspondents pursued their calling centuries before the discovery of the art of printing. Ben Pearly Poor, January 1874. So, uh, so with all that said, Twain actually, um, in the, uh, 1853 kind of runs away from home in Hannibal and he goes to St. Louis, New York, Philadelphia, comes down to Washington. So I start the book by talking about Twain coming to the city as an 18 year old. And this is after kind of Charles Dickens and Alexis de Tocqueville have written about Washington. We know some of the kind of these famous quotes and Twain is another um, another one that we should add to these pre-Civil War uh, Washington writers. So this is Twain um, waiting to catch basically the, like the streetcar or the bus and uh, with, with my uh, research assistant here we take the 16th street bus all the time which runs frequently but taking like the 70 bus you wait forever so when i when i read this quote this kind of reminded me of my experience is taking the 70 bus okay this is uh samuel clemens in february 1854 he's waiting on pennsylvania avenue then if you should be seized with the desire to go to the capital or somewhere else you may stand in a puddle of water with the snow driving in your face for 15 minutes or more before an omnibus rolls lazily by and when one does come 10 to 1 there are 19 passengers inside and 14 outside and while the driver casts on you a look of commiseration you have the inexpressible satisfaction of knowing that you closely resemble a very moist dish rag and feel so too at the same time that you are unable to discover what benefit you have derived from your 15 minutes soaking and so and so, driving your fists into the inmost recesses of your breeches' pockets, you stride away in despair, with a step and grimace that would make the fortune of a tragedy actor, while your ornery appearance is greeted with screams of laughter from a pack of vagabond boys over the way. Such is life, and such is Washington. <laughs> All right, so, um, so, when tw so when Twain comes to Washington, his fame is not determined. He's still really kind of a, a freelance journalist. He comes to Washington to write for the Virginia City Territorial Enterprise, the California Daily Alta California. He's also picked up some correspondence from the New York Tribune and some other papers. So he really was a working, uh, like a freelance journalist, um, which still goes on today. I mean, I write for like a lot of different newspapers and online stuff. So it's kind of the tradition still goes on today. So um, 
he comes to Washington and he's he's the papers announced that Mark Twain had arrived, but it was just a short little blurb. He really was kind of um, someone that people thought, who's this guy? He's not going to amount to much. But um, I have his experiences in Washington, he gets his first publishing contract, which I don't think I'm going to go into detail about that. But uh, his first book, The Innocents Abroad, um, he actually got the contract to write that book in Washington. But anyway, so when he comes to D.C., uh, he kind of observes uh, some of the things that are very similar uh, to today's Washington. One thing is the weather. All right. And Twain, Twain wrote this uh, after being in Washington for about 10 days. So he writes this in early December 1867. As politics goes, so goes the weather. It trims to suit every phase of sentiment and is always ready. Today it is a Democrat, tomorrow radical. The next day neither one thing nor the other. If a Johnson man goes over to the other side, it rains. If a radical deserts to the administration, it snows. If New York goes Democratic, it blows. Naturally enough, if Grant expresses an opinion between two whiffs of smoke, it spits a little sleet uneasily. If all is quiet on the Potomac of politics, one sees only the soft haze of Indian summer from the Capitol windows. If the president is quiet, the sun comes out. If he touches the tender gold market it turns up cold and freezes out the speculators if he hints at foreign troubles it hails if he threatens congress it thunders if treason and impeachment are broached lo there's an earthquake which a couple years ago we had an earthquake uh if you are posted on politics you are posted on the weather i cannot manage either when i go out with an umbrella the sun shines if i go without it it rains if i have my overcoat with me i'm bound to roast if i haven't i am bound to freeze some people like washington weather i don't some people had some people Admire mixed weather. I prefer to take mine straight. <laughs> so, uh, so you know all this stuff about global, all this stuff about global warming and uh, you know or climate change and everything like that. I mean, from going 70 degrees, this is re just recently went from 70 degrees to two days later it's snowing. So this has been going on for a for a long time. So, uh, so yeah. So Twain kind of pals around with a bunch of journalists, which um, I guess I'll get into that a little later. Um, but he really was. Uh, he was a character, and uh, and he was furiously writing. And I'll give a li this is a little insight into how how um, what he was doing in Washington. This is he's writing a letter to um, a friend of his. This is in February of 1868. I've written 182 note paper pages of newspaper matter at a dollar a page and seven of magazine stuff at four dollars a page in the last two days if i can write as much more in the next two days i will be all right again i just want to show them that when i make contracts i'm writing to fill them and then i will throw up all my correspondence except about 75 dollars a week and sail in on my book because i've made a tip-top splendid contract with a great publishing house in hartford for a 600 page volume illustrated about the size of a patent office report my percentage is a fifth more than they have ever paid any man uh, but Horace Greeley, I get what amounts to just about the same he was paid. But this is, but this is the publisher's secret. Keep it to yourself. So when Twain is in Washington, he gets a, um, a publishing offer from the American Publishing Con uh, American Publishing Company. Um, when he gets this offer to uh, to write a book, he's kind of caught in between. What is he going to do? He's already in Washington. He was staying with Senator Stewart at 14th and F Street. He would stay up all night. Uh, he would drink the senator's uh, alcohol. He'd smoke his cigars. The landlady actually said to the senator, you need to get this this guy out because he's going to catch the um, bed sheets on fire. And if this place goes up on flames, I'm going to be without a house, and so are you. So it's either it's either you go or Twain goes. So Senator Stewart kicks out Twain. Um, so he's kind of in Washington. He's palling around with these other journalists, kind of on newspaper row. Um, and Andrew Johnson's impeachment is moving. Um, I mean, this has been going on for more than a year, but it's really starting to pick up pace. So it's moving from the Congress to the Senate. Um, so Twain was actually not even interested in covering Johnson's impeachment. He skips town, goes to San Francisco to negotiate the letters to write his first book, Innocence Abroad. But that's a little bit of an insight into how um, how much he was writing. <coughs> Now here, this you guys will like this. So, so Twain, uh, Twain was in Washington. He moved around by his own admission five different times. He lived on Indi kind of where City Hall is today, um, or Indiana Avenue. Um, he also lived on C Street, kind of near four and a half between four and a half and six Street, so kind of where like the museum is. Um, he also 14th and F was where he stayed with Senator Stewart. Um, but uh, he was such a character that 20 years later, journalists actually still remembered how much of a slob he was. And here is here here is here is one of um. This is actually reading. This is interesting. In his room, the vis um so uh, it's crazy describing this. Okay, in his room, the visitor was always welcome. For by nature, Twain is so lazy that he will not work if there's an excuse for loafing. He had a little back room that was a novelty, a museum, a hermit's cave, a den for a wild animal, and the wild animal was there. So the wild animal, the wild animal being Twain. So this is how um, this is how um, Ramsdell, who was a, a well-known journalist, describes Twain. 
Twain's living conditions. Twain's little drum stove was full of ashes running over on the zinc sheet, which was covered all over. The bed seemed to be unmade for a week. The slops being um, the slop jars where you would kind of, you know, pee and poop into. Uh, the slops had not been carried out for a fortnight. The room was sour with tobacco smoke. The room was sour with tobacco smoke. The floor, dirty enough to begin with, was littered with newspapers from which Twain had cut his letters. Then there were hundreds of pieces of torn manuscripts which had been written and then rejected by the author. A dozen pipes were about the apartment, on the washstand, on the mantel, on the writing table, on the chairs, everywhere that room could be found. And then there was tobacco, and tobacco everywhere. One thing is that there were no flies. The smoke killed them. And I'm... <laughs> And I'm now surprised that it did not kill me, too. Twain would not let a servant come into his room. He would strip down to his suspenders, his coat and vest, of course, being off, and walk back and forward in slippers in his little room and swear and smoke the whole day long. Of course, at times, he would work, and when he did work, it was like a steam engine at full head. Um, many people were very helpful in this book, the Library of Congress, um, of course, where I worked at D.C. Library in the Washingtoniana collection. But um, the Mark Twain papers at UC Berkeley, I was not physically able to go there, but Vic Fisher... Um, was very helpful and actually John Russell Young who was the editor of the New York Tribune the big time editor in New York um, Twain was writing for the New York Tribune um, Russell Young goes on later to be the librarian of one of the librarians of Congress and um, in the late 1880s John Russell Young is actually kind of compiling a bog um, kind of reminiscences of his life as well as people he knew and he got in contact with Twain's room uh, Twain's landlord when Twain lived on Indiana Avenue and it's an uh, unpublished, unpublished letter that Hoagland, his name was J.H. Hoagland, was Twain's landlord. And he sends um, to John Russell Young basically an account describing kind of very similar to what I just read to you, how kind of dirty and Twain was. But this is actually a, a little drawing or sketch that Hoagland sent to John Russell Young. And so um, I'm not an academician or academic. That's why I, put, I graduated from Greenwood uh, Elementary School with honors. Or I guess that's or I guess that's when they have gifted and talented. I guess that's you can't say that now. But uh, so anyway, so that's my little dig because uh, I, I I think I uncovered some new information in this that Twain scholars will like as well as um, local Washingtonians. So okay, and of course I encourage you to buy the book and you can find out more about Twain's boarding houses. Um, okay, so basically when Twain is working for these senators, he really kind of didn't take it very seriously. He took it as a big joke because Twain kind of thought everything was a big joke. Well, the senators didn't take, uh, didn't take a liking to what he did. What he did is uh, Twain was supposed to answer the constituent letters, which, uh, man, that's a recipe for disaster, isn't it? So, okay, I'll just read you one. This is, this is, these are some folks who are appealing to, um, uh, uh, to Senator Nye, who uh, James Nye was, was one of the two senators with Stewart from Nevada. And uh, this is Twain's response to constituents saying that basically we um, are a growing town and we need a post office. Um, okay, uh, Dateline, Washington, November 24, 1867. Gentlemen, what the mischief do you suppose you want with a post office at Baldwin's Ranch? It would not do you any good. If any letters come there, you couldn't read them, you know. And besides, <laughs> such letters... And besides, such letters as ought to pass through with money in them, for other localities would not be would not be likely to get through. You must proceed at once. I'm sorry, you guys are making me crack up. Okay, where was I? Um, and that would okay. Something about basically you only want letters with money in them. Um, no, no, don't bother about a post office in your camp. I have your best interests at heart and feel that it would only be an ornamental folly. What you want is a nice jail. You know. <laughs> Uh, you know, a nice substantial jail and a, and a free school. These will be a lasting benefit to you. These will make you really con contented and happy. I will move in the matter at once. Very truly, Mark Twain for James W. Nye, U.S. Senator. Um, so there's, there's a... There's a... There, in, in, the, in the, uh, the book, there's a whole other collection of those letters, which, which uh, make sure you're not eating when you read them. Um, okay, so continue to go on. Okay, so, so like I said, Twain, I mean, Twain really by his own admission didn't really hit newspaper row. He kind of hung in his room with a gentleman named William Swinton, who I'm, um, William Swinton is a fascinating guy. If anyone is a real scholar here and has read uh, General Grant's memoirs, he actually singles out William Swinton. Uh, Swinton was, a, uh, uh, I'm sorry. 
So Swinton, let me tell a story of how uh, General Grant. So um, William Swinton said uh, he attached himself to the Army of the Potomac and he claimed that he was a historian writing the his what would be a history of the Army of the Potomac. But he actually was writing for the New York Times. His brother, um, John Swinton, was the head uh, chief editorialist for the New York Times. So um, he had kind of been caught uh, writing about um, kind of publishing this, the movements and secrets in the paper and they they'd kind of generals had reached out to Swinton and said, hey, you know, you're not welcome here. What are you doing? And actually, history of journalism is uh, the byline started to happen during the Civil War because uh, writers would publish things and they, the generals would attack the editor, say, well, who wrote it? And so basically to make sure that you were being truthful, you had attached a byline. So that's the byline. History of byline is actually kind of a result of that. But with that said, so Swinton has already been warned. Um, he's then kind of hanging around General Ambrose Burnside's camp. And uh, Burnside and his kind of um, his cat is his commanders and staff sergeants and captains, lieutenants, all this stuff. They're having a little meeting, and they see this guy kind of sl uh, slumping behind a tree. And so they, they reach out and they find him. They kind of rough him up a little bit and say, well, what are you doing? And then they finally got us that he was a journalist. And then so Burnside knew that he had already been warned, so they were going to um, literally um, – shoot him they were going to shoot to kill him like on the spot so i guess before you're going to uh assassinate a journalist you had to kind of send uh send the orders up to um command headquarters and so grant grant general grant finds out about this and says no you know we you know we cannot be in the business of uh shooting journalists <laughs> so anyway so uh so but 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 william swinton let's let william swinton left such an over um oversized memory on grant that he actually includes this story in grant's memoirs so with that said this is one of the guys that twain's li twain lives with in washington so i mean can you imagine these two characters so basically um the story is um that Swinton was really, uh, really an alcoholic, um, or I guess a romantic alcoholic. Um, so, uh, so Twain and Twain and Swinton, they they uh, they they created kind of this newspaper syndicate where they basically would write these Washington stories and they would send them to kind of out of the way newspapers um, because there was a great pride in having like a Washington correspondent. So essentially, they would take the, take the same story and um, send it out to about twelve different papers, and of course, hoping that the twelve different papers did not know that. You know, they, they did not have exclusive rights to this. So Twain and Swinton would do this because they needed money for their John Barleycorn. And um, they, there's a story about Twain is at the Ebbett house and he's kind of down his luck. He's trying to figure out how to hustle money. And he sees this wayward dog. And then basically he sells the dog to somebody. And then they say they need the, And then the owner comes back and then he gets the dog back. It's kind of a really interesting, stupid story. But I won't go into detail in the book. But, um, but, uh, but so with all that said, I mean, Twain, Twain wrote for... Um, wrote over two dozen uh, newspapers, or excuse me, over two dozen newspaper stories. Um, I actually include something in here from a California paper that has the Mark Twain in Washington. He wrote a couple things for the Evening Star and the Daily Morning Chronicle, um, but most of his most of his correspondence were for out-of-town newspapers. But Twain also uh, hit the social scene. Um, does anyone know the Gap Building in Georgetown? Well, that was actually Forest Hall. Twain gave a lecture there on February 21st, 1868. The proceeds went to benefit the um, Age, Women's, Age Women's Home of Georgetown, which is across the street. Um, he also, um, well, I'm getting a little ahead of myself. But Twain also hit the social scene a little bit. Like Scholar Colfax, who was the vi um, Speaker of the House, he was vi Grant's first Vice President. He lived in Lafayette Square. It's really interesting is when... Uh, Speaker of the House would have receptions they would advertise in the Evening Star. And they would say, basically, um, everyone is welcome from 12 to 3. I mean, you can imagine that, you know, they wouldn't do that nowadays. <laughs> so anyway, so um, so when Twain, when Twain is at one of uh, Colfax's receptions, Emily Edson Briggs is there. Now, does anyone know who Emily Edson Briggs is or was? All right, Emily Edson Briggs is a, sorry, I, I guess, sorry if I'm asking questions that are falling flat, just trying to get a little participation. <laughs> But uh, Emily Emily Edson Briggs was a arguably the uh, most prominent uh, female journalist of the 19th century. Um, I should give a shout out to Donald Ritchie, um, who wrote a wrote a forward for the book. Uh, Don Ritchie wrote um, the Press Gallery in the early 1990s, which is a really great book. It kind of talks about the history of Washington correspondence, and Emily Edson Briggs has her own chapter. So with that said, Briggs um, uh, caught caught uh, Twain and kind of described him at one of Colfax's receptions and. Um, and I think this is a pretty good description. Mark Twain, the delicate humorist, was present, quite a lion, as he deserves to be. Mark is a bachelor, faultless in taste, whose snowy vest is suggestive of endless quarrels of Washington washerwomen. But the heroism of Mark is settled for all time, for such purity and smoothness were never seen before. His lavender gloves might have been stolen from some Turkish harem. So delicate were they in size, but more likely anything else were more likely than that. In form and feature, he bears some resemblance to the immortal Nasby, but whilst petroleum is brunette to the core, Twain is golden, amber-hued, melting blonde. 
So, um, so Twain was definitely someone who was known to the Washington ladies. Um, he, Olivia Langdon, he actually leaves Washington to go to New York to meet her for the first time. Um, okay. Some more Twain in the social scene. Uh, the Newspaper Correspondence Club had their annual uh annual kind of uh, dinner and Twain was invited to speak and he was invited to give the toast on women which I won't I won't read his toast but it is pretty funny but um, when they, they kind of were partying late into the night and they got to this problem where they're approaching 12 midnight and I mean nowadays um, kind of the Sabbath Sunday eh, whatever but back then it really was a big deal you know you're not supposed to drink on the Sabbath so like back in the um, 19th century they took it seriously so these journalists um are all kind of like oh my gosh what happens it's going to strike midnight you know we can't we can't drink past the sabbath well they came up with an ingenious plan to extend the evening which twain relayed in one of his uh, washington letters at 12 midnight it was announced from the chair that the sabbath was come and that a due regard for the christian character of our country demanded that the festivities should now come to abrupt terminate to an abrupt termination the regular toasts were not finished yet the fun was at its zenith here was a scrape uh, how would you have gotten out of it? I will tell you how we managed it, and it will be worth your while to lay the information away for private use hereafter. It was gravely moved and is gravely seconded and carried, quote, that we do now discontinue the use of Washington time and adopt the time of San Francisco. <laughs> and then and then we and then we hailed as and then we hailed along as we I'm sorry, and we we bowled along as serenely as ever. We gained about three hours and a half by the operation. How was that? for ingenuity it was easy sailing after that when we had when we had used up all the san francisco time and got to crowding sunday again we took another vote and adopted hong kong time <laughs> i su i suppose i suppose we would have been going west yet if the champagne had not given out <laughs> all right um all right um i guess to give some more a little brief brief preview of the book um twain was someone who there's been a lot written about twain and race um and like is huck finn an honest portrayal is a dishonest portrayal is jim an honest character is he a minstrel character etc etc um there's actually a scholar in the early 1990s that posited that uh, huck finn's was huck finn is actually a black character in terms of his his vernacular is of uh uh, uh from black folks so that huck finn is really kind of like a black character which is interesting um when Twain was in Washington, he wrote this thing called the um, story of uh, General Washington's Negro body servant, which has really been kind of overlooked in the Mark Twain canon. And I went into uh, great depth in the book to talk about what Twain was writing about, which I won't. Um, it probably doesn't. It, it needs a lot of explaining, but hopefully you read it. But it's really something basically where even into the early 1900s um there was somebody claiming that they were general washington's body servant and general washington died in 1799 and this is 1913. so so i so i go into detail about how basically twain when he when he was in washington he had left missouri in 1861 he was in nevada california he was in the um sandwich islands which now known as hawaii he traveled to the holy land which is now i guess known as the middle east and twain when he's in washington is really his first time back in the south in um more than more than a half half um half decade so uh twain was something really interesting he was very perceptive to um like race issues and um he did write something about kind of washington's kind of race history or, or heritage that uh i think is fascinating so okay so uh andrew johnson is impeached um in late february 26 uh or excuse me late february 1868 the impeachment trial moves from the congress um to the senate they actually have to try it if anyone here of course remembers um President Clinton's kind of impeachment trial. Um, so, I mean, it was a really, really big story. But Twain had this publishing contract. He wanted to kind of become a man of letters. He kind of abandoned journalism. So he leaves Washington. He's like, oh, you guys, you journalists have a good time writing up, you know, Andy Johnson's impeachment. I'm out of here. So he goes to San Francisco. And um, Twain would frequently come back to Washington almost every year because of um, copyright hearing. Um, Twain was someone that... Um, really wanted an extension of copyright law um the kind of modern copyright law that we have today actually is a little bit in credit to mark twain um so when he comes back to washington there's a bookstore that he went to which i know we're at politics and prose which i love this bookstore but i also love capitol hill books which is a used bookstore with my friend jim tool over there across from eastern market um jim tool is kind of similar to a proprietor of a bookstore that twain went to um i go into detail about that 
But uh, Mark Twain in the, the white suit. Well, how is that relevant to Washington? Well, in December of 1906, at a Library of Congress um, copyright hearing, Twain actually premieres this white suit. He was one of the last people to testify that day. He was in a black frock. He was in a black frock coat. And um, about 4 p.m., he's called to testify. He kind of throws off the black frock coat. Oh my gosh, it's scandalous! He's wearing white. It's December. What is he doing? <laughs> he's upturning the conventions of the season. And um, and Twain kind of makes an impassioned argument for an extension of the copyright law. It took a couple years um, for the law that he uh, that he kind of wanted to be passed. And um, I mean, Speaker of the House Joe Cannon, Champ Clark, all these folks Twain knew. I mean, the presidents. There's book, books about Twain and Roosevelt. Um, so uh, so yeah. So like librarians of Congress, Twain knew all these guys. And uh, kind of getting a little off off my topic here because I'm running out. of Trying to wrap this up smoothly, but does anyone know? Does anyone know the Adams Memorial, the grief statue? Yeah. It's actually rumored that Twain actually um, is the source of it being calling be, being called grief. Um, Albert Bigelow Payne was Twain's kind of appointed biographer. They lived together for about two and a half years. It's really interesting. I talk about this in the book. Um, that uh, oh, I should okay. I'm sorry. I do have something to tie this up nicely after the after the grief memorial. Okay. So um, so they're in, they're in, they're in they're in Washington and um, Twain is even though he's kind of this ah, he's this funny man ha 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 he really was a dark guy. Um, I mean his wife died his two daughters died. Um, he really was someone beset with tragedy throughout his whole life. And so so Albert Bigelow Payne says that um, in New York Twain had um, a newspaper and he was looking at this new this new Adams Memorial and he said well when we're in Washington we want to see it. So they arranged to get a carriage. They go up to Rock Creek. Um, Rock Creek Cemetery, and they're looking at the, uh, the, the the statue, and so Payne says, you know, oh, it's very remorseful, it's very, you know, I'm deeply touched, and it's very, and then Payne says, well, it's very quiet, and Twain says, no, it's not quiet, it's speaking to me very loudly. Um, so obviously somehow touched Twain, and um, Big, Payne says that Twain actually had a postcard of the grief memorial on his mantle in New York until the day that he died. So I think that's pretty interesting, but let me let me wrap this up nicely. Okay, so 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 Peacock, so Peacock Alley. Let's see if I can find the little excerpt here. Um, probably not. Probably won't be able to find it verbatim, but I'll just tell you. So Peacock Alley in the Willard Hotel, and actually really interesting. When Twain was in Washington, the Arling, Arlington Hotel on Vermont Avenue was the premier hotel. The Willard Hotel, which in a letter uh, 1871, uh, Twain refers to the Willard as a seventh-rate hash house. <laughs> so. Um, <laughs> Uh, now, Twain did uh, involve in uh, activities with hash in San Francisco, but it's not known that he did any of that stuff in Washington. But and some people are really interested in that counterculture Twain stuff. But um, so the story is after he after he has kind of this very um, triumphant appearance at the uh, at the Library of Congress in his white suit, he goes back to uh, the Willard and he has this dinner and you know he wants to make a great entrance and so he decides to uh, you know take the elevator. Well the elevator opens into the dining room. So he kinda gets out and everyone's kinda like continues on with their meals. They're not very, you know, not very amused that Twain, you know, is in the dining room. So he says, uh, Payne says I mean Twain says to Payne, well, you know, that's 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 not gonna work. We got we gotta have a grander entrance. So it goes back up to his room and then decides to kind of take the stairs down and he kind of uh swaggers down Peacock Alley and kinda you know, hey, good to see you, all that stuff. And then makes a grand entrance into the uh into the dining room and Peacock Alley today in the Willard Hotel, you know, kind of like the spirit of Mark Twain kind of still walks those halls. Okay, so um I want to give time for question and answer. That's why I tried to cut this short. But uh, yeah, so um, this is really an excavation of Mark Twain's time in Washington. I found something that uh, the Scupper Nong letter, which is possibly a Mark Twain writing that hasn't kind of been formally added to his canon. Um, like I said, I talk about like George Alfred Townsend, who really kind of people have forgotten, but he was um, a very prominent journalist of the ni um, second half of the 19th century. He was he was buddies with uh, Twain. I, talk a little bit about, about that, Matthew Brady, some of these other kind of characters that it might be household names, some might, might, might not be household names, but um, I think it came together very nicely, and I'm glad that everyone is here. I'm actually kind of humbled that this is such a large crowd, um, and I guess with that, I will uh, open it up for questions. You mentioned a tour, but is there a list of uh, addresses or places where Twain uh, lived and worked uh, around here? Yes, that's, that's a great question. Um, well, yeah, so uh, thank you for the plug for the tour. So if you go online, just Google John Muller 
uh, side tour, John Muller, Mark Twain tour, Frederick Douglass tour. It'll show, it'll pop up. I don't have like information here. We're, um, so that's a little plug. Okay, so the address is Twain. 14th and F Street is where he uh, boarded with Senator Stewart. Um, 76 Indiana Avenue is, um, we know that address because Twain sent a letter using that address. 356 C Street, uh, he wrote between 4 and a half and 6th Street is another address that he used. Um, oh, I didn't tell the cow story. Uh, <laughs> Well, uh, I was I, I was gonna say the cow story because Twain spent a lot of time kind of around City Hall. Actually, let me read. Let me see if I can find the little cow thing. Um, I'm sorry. This this just gives a nice. Okay, here we go. Well, I say this because this gives insights into where Twain was living. He reported on the um, the police court, which is uh, not there anymore, but it was at Fifth and D North uh, Northwest. He reported on kind of what was going on there. So he obviously must have hung out there. He lived near there. And uh, this was an item that appeared in the uh, Evening Star, November 25, 1867. Local news. No cow allowed about the city hall. Mayor Wallach yesterday complained of Washington Rollins, Catherine Madison, Patrick Foley, Sarah E. Cook, and Mary Carroll as allowing their cows to trespass upon the lot in the rear of the city hall. They were arraigned before Justice Walter, who fined each five dollar each five dollars and one dollar cost. Sarah E. Cook, who had three cows, was required to pay eighteen dollars. Now, why am I reading that? Because a couple uh, weeks later, Twain wrote his own little vignette. Uh, about cows in Washington. On New Year's morning, while Mr. George Worley's front door was standing open, a cow marched into the house, a cow that was out making her annual calls, I suppose. And before she... And before she was discovered, had eaten up everything on the New Year's table in the parlor. Mr. Worley was not acquainted with the cow, never saw her before, and is at a loss to account for the honor of her visit. What do you think of a town where cows make New Year's calls? It may be the correct thing, but it has been so regarded in the circles in which I have been accustomed to move. Morals are at a low stage in Washington, beyond question. So I... <laughs> So, so I, I say I say that because Twain kind of really would have hung out like Pennsylvania Avenue where the telegraph. Well, Twain was too cheap to use the telegraph office, but he kind of would have hung out because that's where his buddies would have had money or working for serious papers would have telegraphed their stories. But kind of like Pennsylvania Avenue, uh, French of Richardson's, which is a bookstore at. Um, Gosh, the address escapes me. Well, it's in the book, but it was on Pennsylvania Avenue, I think, Fourth and Pennsylvania Avenue. Twain's Jumping Frog book was advertised there, so he obviously would have hit that bookstore. Another bookstore on. Um, 111 Pennsylvania Avenue, the kind of old Washington Curiosity Shop we know Twain went to. Um, hope that's kind of a long answer to your question. Go ahead. I got here late, so you may have covered this. Um, the Willard Hotel boasts that uh, Mark Twain, uh, during the last five years of his life, wrote two books at the hotel. What books were they? Yes. Um, early on in my research, I actually used that claim too. Um, I don't know if it's true. Um, I think Twain, when he was in Washington, would have written parts of the no whatever novel he was working on. I mean, Twain was always writing plays, novels. Uh, I mean, he wrote something about is Shakespeare dead? Kind of. He wrote something about Joan of Arc. Um, he was al he was always furiously writing. Um, it's it's within reason to believe that when Twain was staying in at the Willard, which post when kind of the Willard um, was renovated, I guess like 1904, I think, um, when Twain is, comes to Washington in his later years, if he was writing something, he would have probably continued to write that while he was at the Willard. But the, like Twain wouldn't, Twain did not stay at the Willard for like weeks on end and like write. Um, and I, I, I can't think of the two books that they claim that he wrote there. But uh, I would say there's like a small little grain of truth there that's kind of been over amplified or magnified to kind of use that claim i mean twain does have a lot of associations and connections with the willard um but i think that's a little bit of a stretch yeah did, did twain ever meet dickens and you really ought to tell the full story of that dog in general miles that's one of the funniest things i ever read i think a certain french uh, detective uh, that we all love would have been interested in so that. you know the story well i read i read your book your okay. co-workers prominently display it at the library oh excellent great thank you um and all and uh, if the books do sell out here please if you have a dc library card please use the dc library card thank you for your um your question um yeah so the way i kind of preface twain coming to washington as a teenager as i talk about dickens i talk about tocqueville some of their remarks on washington um dickens actually comes to washington uh, on his second kind of U.S. tour, he came to Washington when Tyler was president, 1842. Uh, goes to Eastern Penitentiary, all that stuff, kind of hits the scenes. He writes his American notes for general circulation. He comes then back to the United States um, in late 1867, early 1868. He actually 
uh, lectures in Washington in February of 1868, Twain went to one of Dickens' lectures in New York. He actually, um, Charlie Langdon, Charlie Langdon, Charles Langdon was brothers of Olivia Langdon. The whole story is Twain took this kind of like um, carnival cruise, let's say, of its day to the Middle East. Uh, Charlie Langdon, he was buddies with him, showed him a little locket of his sister. Twain fell madly in love with this woman. He didn't even know who she was. Just, oh, my gosh, your picture. So basically, uh, uh, Twain goes to New York and then meets Olivia Langdon for the first time. And it was at a Dickens lecture. Um, Twain wasn't someone who probably could have commanded an audience with Dickens at that time. Um... So I don't know that they, let's say, ever like met. Um, and I'm not like a Dickensian scholar, but I don't think they ever met. Walt Whitman and Twain, um, when Whitman later in life in like the 1880s needed money, Twain sent him money. Um, I'm not a Whitman scholar. I'm, I'm not sure if they met. I'm assuming that they met. While they were in Washington, they were in Washington at the same time. And I know that they did not meet while they were in Washington in the winter of 1867, 1868. Um, I guess that's another long answer. Well, first, there was some story about a dog that the gentleman before me asked about who said he said was very funny. Uh, what's well, really, I, I don't, I'm not the uh, most articulate speaker, so let me see if I can find the story because it's better to use Twain's words um, in the story. Well, actually, how about this? I will look up in the index, and, and why don't we ask another question, and then after your next question, I will tell the dog story. Page 65. 65. Thank you, sir. I love, I love a uh, sharp audience. Okay. So, oh, here we go. Okay. 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 Oh gosh, this might be a little long, but it's all right. We'll go. Okay. Well, it's just good enough. All right. Um. So this is this is my this is Twain and Swinton. And if I t if I tell somebody you're my William Swinton, that's the greatest compliment I could give you. Okay. So uh, while it's, uh, okay. Okay. So Twain and Swinton, although we didn't get rich. Uh, it kept the jug going and partly fed the two of us. Um, doo -doo -doo. Okay, a, so a shortage occurred, so they needed money for their John Barleycorn. A shortage occurred, and we had to have three dollars, and we had to have it before the close of the day. Swinton directed Twain to go out and find it while he s while he said he would do the same. Swinton didn't seem to have any doubt that he would succeed, but I knew that that was his religion working in him. I, I hadn't the same confidence. I hadn't any idea of where to turn to raise all that bullion, and I said so. Twain inferred that Swinton was ashamed of him because of my weak faith. He told me to give uh, myself no uneasiness, no concern, and said in a simple, confident, and unquestioning way, the Lord will provide. Twain wandered around the streets for an hour trying to think up some way to get that money, but nothing suggested itself. Twain took a break. Now I'm just, this is kind of narration. This isn't necessarily just all quotes. Uh, Twain took a break at the Ebbett House, where a dog came loafing along. He paused, glanced up at me, and said with his eyes, are you friendly? Twain answered with his eyes that he was. The dog wagged its tail and advanced to Twain, resting its jaw on my knee and lifting his brown eyes to my face in a winningly affectionate way. Twain stroked his smooth brown head and fondled his drooping ears, and we were a pair of lovers right away. And then in the next moment, Brigadier General Nelson A. Miles, the hero of the land, came strolling by in his blue and gold splendors with everybody's admirer gazing upon him. General Miles saw the dog, and a light in his eyes showed that he had a warm place in his heart for dogs like this gracious creature. Then he came forward and patted the dog. The general asked if the dog was for sale. I was greatly moved, Twain recalled. It's <laughs> Now remember, Twain needs money, right? He needs money to get his drink on. Uh, it seemed a marvelous thing to me the way Swinton's prediction had come true. The general asked the price of which Twain responded $3. Although the general offered to pay more, Twain was steadfast and steadfast and asking only three dollars getting what he thought was a bargain the general handed twain the money and led the dog away and disappeared upstairs pleased at how providence had come through twain sat there in his small victory unmoved in about 10 minutes a gentle-faced middle-aged gentleman came along and began to look around here and there and under <laughs> tables and everywhere twain asked twain saw this and asked the man if if he was looking for a dog his face was sad before and troubled but it lit up gladly now twain had seen the dog and the gentleman whom the dog had followed he confessed without implicating himself in the disappearance <laughs> twain 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 offered to help find the canine I've, I've seldom seen a person look so grateful, and there was gratitude in his voice, too, when he, conduct, when he conceded that he would like me to try. I said I would do it with great, great pleasure, but, the, the, I'm sorry, but that as it might take a little time. I hoped he would not mind paying me something for my trouble. <laughs> Payment would be no trouble, the man said, and then he asked how much. Twain replied, $3. The man, the man offered to pay $10, but Twain declined. No, the... 
No, three is the price. He said, starting for the stairs without waiting, without waiting for the argument for Swint, without waiting for the argument, for Swinton had said that he w- that that was the amount the Lord would provide, and it seemed to me that it would be sacrilegious to take a penny more than was promised. <laughs> Twain obtained the general's room number from the clerk, and when I reached the room, I found the general there, careless, uh, caressing his dog and quite happy. To the general's vexation, Twain said he needed the dog back. Take him again, General Miles asked. I was saying, take him again. General Miles asked, why, he is my dog. You sold him to me and at your own price. That all was true, Twain agreed, but I have him But I have him because the man wants him again. What man, the general asked, the man that owns him. He wasn't my dog. <laughs> Twain, uh, Twain admitted. After a brief argument, Twain paid back the $3 and led the dog downstairs, passed him over to his owner, and collected three for my trouble. <laughs> Tw- Twain went away with a good conscience because I had acted honorably. I never could have used the three that I sold the dog for because it was not rightly mine. But the three I got for restoring him to his rightful owner was righteously and properly mine because I had earned it. That man might never have gotten the dog back at all if, I, if it hadn't been for me. And then, and then uh, nearly 40 years later, Twain met General Miles and he commented on the fact that we had known each other 30, for, uh, known each other 30 years. General Miles said it was strange that he, uh, we had not met years before when we had both been in Washington. At that point, Twain changed the subject and he, uh, cha- <laughs> and, he cha- and he changed it with art. The general seemed not to remember Twain's part in the adventure and Twain never had the heart to tell him. How can I ask a sort of a straightforward, serious question after that? Um, Grant and Twain? Did they ha- they had a relationship, didn't they? Yes, they very much had a relationship. Um, so yeah, so not to get into the minutia of Twain studies and Twain scholarship, but um, I have a whole chapter devoted to the Scupper Nong letter, which is something that appeared in the New York Times on November 29, 1867. Um, it's the only time the Scupper Nong byline ever appears. Um, a day later, the Evening Telegraph out of Philadelphia reprinted the story and used the Mark Twain byline. And the Scupper Nong story was basically a journalist is fresh to the city and he knows that uh, for any enterprising journalist, the first thing he needs to do is to uh, interview the general. And at this time, uh, General Grant is actually in Washington. Um, the story is very, very similar to a story that Twain wrote later. And the whole, his whole pitch was Twain is basically trying to get General Grant to say, well, are you going to run for election? You know, what's your position on impeachment? What do you think about this? What do you think about that? Trying to basically get the, the general to give very politi- politicized answers. And so Grant is very reticent. So Twain kind of like makes up or infers, interprets from basically his, his facial expressions what he's saying. So, <laughs> so anyway, so Twain kind of stuck with this little kind of like little shtick, I guess, um, uh, early on. But um, Twain did meet uh, Grant at the uh, uh, at a reception, uh, Senator Nye introduced them. Um, they had, I mean, they knew each other. They, they had a relationship. Uh, I guess in 1877, after Grant takes kind of this whirlwind tour after he's president, he kind of goes around the world. And then there's a reception in Chicago. Twain kind of gives like the um, the big toast. Uh, he's kind of stumbling. It's kind of an interesting story. Then he kind of basically saves himself from falling flat on his face. Um, so, I mean, Twain, obviously, I mean, to be asked to give the, the toast um, when mm-hmm. Grant is coming back was a big sure. deal. Sure. Um, it's an interesting story, kind of, well, how does Twain publish Grant's memoirs? Um, there's, a re- there's a new book out about, I think it's called, like, something Bushwhacker and Grant, Confederate Bushwhacker and President Grant. Um, and I think it talks about just 1885. 1885, and I'm not really, like, a Mark Twain scholar, uh, my focus is just his time in Washington, but um, it is an interesting story because there's a book called Grant Twain. It came out probably about 10, 15 years ago. Great goes into great detail about Grant had published kind of some of his initial memoirs in the Mer- uh, the, the Century magazine, and Grant was initially going to publish his um, memoirs kind of with the different publishers, but Twain for years had kind of been saying to him, hey, you got to write your memoirs. And then Twain um, had a publishing company and he basically gave Grant terms that he couldn't turn down. And um, as we kind of all know the story, basically Grant kind of basically works until his, when he's on his deathbed, I mean, basically finishes a week later, he dies. It's a, it's an incredible bestseller. It secures the financial um, security of his family. And I mean, Twain made a lot, of, a lot of money off publishing the book. And actually, there was even contemporary press reports that basically, like, there's something, um, 
like something was wrong something like twain shouldn't be making so much money from general grant like he should give the money to the um the widows and you know orphans and stuff like that um but i mean twain made about two hundred thousand dollars which is incredible amount even today he made that much money off of grant's memoirs um but they definitely were people who had a mutual respect for each other um, i mean grant knew like president cleveland roosevelt um all these all these guys but um i mean it's really is it really is kind of interesting uh twain like enlisted kind of in this ragtag group of confederates called the marion county rangers which is out of missouri and and he right twain writes actually the, the story about his services or his failed service in the kind of the confederate army it was published in 1885 and twain essentially says that uh i knew more about retreating than the man who created retreating and so it's kind of kind of goes with that story so it is kind of interesting here twain is kind of like this can fail failed confederate soldier and then here's general grant you know the had the Union forces and president, but they had, but they had a, you know, a, a, a strong relationship with each other. Thank you. They all keep uh, claiming some intimacy with him, calling him Twain, sometimes even Mark. Does anyone ever refer to him as Samuel Clemens? Yes, yes. Oh, well, that's a. Uh, so yeah, well, I mean, I just some people refer to like Twain as Clemens, and then it's like, well, was th this. Because this you know, otherwise it's fake familiarity. Because right, his, right. His, his persona. It's I mean, there was uh, Thomas Edison had some quote that said basically, you know, hopefully people love their families, and if they have any extra love, they usually they usually reserve it for Mark Twain. Um, so it's, I mean, so so Twain so Twain was someone that really was um, someone that people felt intimate with. I mean, just bec like reading Huck Finn or reading Tom Story, they felt like they kind of knew him. Um, but his friends, his longtime friends, would call him Sam or Sammy. Mm -hmm. Um, Twain would sign his letters Samuel Clemens. Twain was kind of his, his literary persona. Um, and I mean, for my book, I've talked about his persona, so I refer to him as Twain. But um, I mean, like people would write, let's say like his fans, his fans would write letters to say, you know, dear Mr. Twain or dear Mark Twain. Whereas fr friends from like Missouri um, would, you know, say, hey, Sammy, or, you know, dear Samuel or something like that. Um, Thank, thank you, everyone.